got to be able to see my pictures. I'm Catherine Libin, the scholar in residence for this Mozart Festival, and I want to thank you all for coming out on this very foggy day. Um, but Mozart can shed light even on the foggiest of days, so great to have you here. So during the three weekends of this festival, we're going to be hearing the overtures from Mozart's six mature operas, spanning the years 1782, when Mozart was introducing himself to Vienna and enjoying his first successes, and 1791, when he'd seen some battering to his fortunes, but was still at the height of his powers as a composer. All six of these overtures are terrific works for orchestra and perfectly satisfying heard on their own. But it's important to remind ourselves that all of them were originally performed in theaters and designed to introduce and set the stage for dramatic works. All of them were part of a long tradition of providing instrumental accompaniment for theatrical experiences, and they served a variety of critical functions. I'd like to provide some context for these works and discuss how they originated and what they meant for Mozart and his audiences. Mozart himself was a consummate man of the theater and had been enthralled by it since he was a child. As an eight-year-old in a visit to London, he was befriended by a number of well-known opera singers, heard them, studied them, and imitated them. When asked to sit at the harpsichord, and improvise operatic overtures and arias on given themes, such as love and rage. He did so with an alacrity and skill that amazed the people who heard him. In his teens, during trips to Italy, Mozart had opportunities to hear a great many operas at big court theaters and at small local community theaters, and to write them himself. He served a long apprenticeship as a composer of dramatic music and made it clear on many occasions that this was what he most wanted to do with his career. Unfortunately, because of the political nature of opera production in Italy and Vienna and elsewhere, without an official theater position, you needed to pull the right strings to get an opera produced. So Mozart never got to write nearly as many operas as he would have liked. But by the 1780s, when the abduction from the Seraglio project came along, he was finding patrons in Vienna and had earned the respect of theater impresarios. And thus we have this substantial handful of operas from the height of his mature composing career. The most important theater in Vienna in Mozart's time was the Burgtheater, or the court theater, which was part of the palace complex in the center of town. It's shown here in the slide at the very far right on St. Michael's Place, across from a large church and right next to the imperial stables and riding school. And I've always loved this image because I think it really illustrates the relative importance of music and horses at the Habsburg court. There were a lot of people involved with running this theater, but the emperor himself, Joseph II, was quite devoted to it and very actively engaged in making decisions about his productions. During the time of abduction of Seraglio, Joseph II had taken over the directorship of the theater, and so he was really um, playing an important role in deciding what went on there. So Mozart was always concerned about earning the interest and the approval of the emperor, and it was really necessary. The emperor's box at the court theater was directly in the center, facing the stage, and in the view in front of you, the stage is at the far left, the royal box is at the right. On either side were three tiers of boxes, and the parterre was divided in the middle with the front half nearer the stage reserved for nobility and the back half open to middle-class auditors. The orchestra sat at shared desks directly in front of the stage. It was in this theater that the first performances of Abduction from the Seraglio and Marriage of Figaro took place. 
And these are images of surviving handbills, which would have been posted all around the town to advertise them. These always give the title of the opera in the original language of the libretto, but also in German for the benefit of the local population. Don Giovanni did not actually premiere in this theater, but it did play here under Mozart's direction in the 1788 season. And this is also where Così Fan Tutte premiered in 1790. So this was a very important place for Mozart's works. Now, two of Mozart's late operas were written for the city of Prague. This was the second city of the Habsburg Empire after Vienna, and it was the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia and a great place for theater. Italian opera companies had been at home in Prague since early in the 18th century when they attracted composers like Vivaldi to come across the Alps and up into Bohemia. In Mozart's time, Prague was an important crossroads for touring troops and traveling singers, and it was a transmission point for operas to and from nearby Dresden and Warsaw. It proudly possessed a new opera theater, known then as the Nostitz Theater, after its founder, Count Nostitz, who was one of Prague's foremost patrons of the arts. It was located at the center of Prague's old town, right next to the university, and on the edge of the fruit market, and it still stands there today. In January 1787, Mozart traveled to Prague in order to direct a new performance of Marriage of Figaro, and it met with a rapturous reception there. Not only did audiences love the opera, the theater musicians loved it and loved working with Mozart. It was their enthusiasm that generated the commission for Don Giovanni, which Mozart wrote over the summer and fall and returned to Prague in October to conduct. Prague has always felt a sense of ownership in regard to Don Giovanni, and it remains the one place in the world where you can count on being able to hear this opera every season. And in fact, if you like marionette theater, you can hear Don Giovanni every day in Prague. The other opera that Mozart wrote for Prague was La Clemenza di Tito. This was a special commission for him. Emperor Joseph II died in 1790, and coronation festivities for his successor, Leopold II, were held throughout the realm. Prague's nobles enlisted Mozart to write a new opera to be performed there for Leopold's coronation as King of Bohemia, and Mozart again returned to the city to direct it. In order to complete what was an urgent commission, because he didn't actually receive it until quite late in the game, Mozart had to lay aside the other opera that he was already working on, which was the Magic Flute. So when he returned to Vienna, he had to plunge back into work to have it ready for its premiere on the 30th of September. This opera was written for a small suburban theater called the Theater auf der Wieden. And the commission came from its impresario, an actor and singer called Emanuel Schikaneder. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the theater itself, perhaps because its clientele comprised members of the lower and middle classes. Um, but we do have a rendering of the stage of the floor plan, and we can see that it was a much smaller, more intimate theater than its courtly counterparts. But it was still capable of elaborate sets and special effects and made something of a specialty of magic operas. The printed advertisement for Magic Flute, which you see here, down in the fine print underneath, it specifically mentions the diligence of the painter and the set designer in creating marvels for Mozart's new opera. Now, in trying to imagine the sound of the overtures and all the other instrumental music that went with these operas, it's obviously important to have some idea of what the house orchestras at these theaters were like. The Nostitz Theater Orchestra in Prague was quite small compared to what was available in Vienna. But all reports suggest that it was an excellent orchestra, and Mozart would have known the players well after hearing them perform Marriage of Figaro. 
So when he wrote Don Giovanni and Clemenza di Tito with them explicitly in mind, we have a very good idea of what they could do. A Czech observer who knew Mozart and wrote the first biography of him, Franz Xaver Niemicek, wrote the following about the Prague Orchestra, and I'll just read you this little passage. He says, the opera orchestra is relatively scantily staffed. It has only three first and second violins, three violas, the basses, and the appropriate winds. But according to the opinions of Mozart and other famous composers, it can be reckoned among the finest. It does not count famous concerto soloists or virtuosi among its members, but all its members are skilled and thorough. Many are first-rate artists, fired by a sense of honor, who through renunciation of personal priorities and a long period of continuous playing together, produce a remarkably unified whole that seems to come forth from a single soul. It has often, without any rehearsal, performed the most difficult pieces of Mozart to his complete satisfaction. So that's a very warm testimonial about this small orchestra. And when he speaks of the small size, um, he mentions only six violins in total and three violas. When he says the basses, he probably means one or two cellos and two contrabasses, which would have been normal. When he says the appropriate winds, winds, he means pairs of winds, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, horns, bassoons, with trumpets and timpani and trombones available as necessary. And in Don Giovanni, Mozart would require all of those, though not all at once in the overture, which I'll say more about in a moment. What I think is so telling is that he speaks about the honor of this body of musicians and of the idea of melding disparate players into a single soul, which I think is a description of an orchestra that remains an ideal even today. Schikaneder's orchestra at the small theater where Magic Flute premiered was much like the Prague Orchestra with the same intimate group of strings and pairs of winds. When a composer received a contract for a new opera, it was expected that along with the composition of the work and a certain amount of rehearsing with the singers and players, he would also personally direct the first three performances from the keyboard. After that, an assistant director would take over and the composer would be free to leave or to attend the performance as Mozart usually did and listen to it from various vantage points in the theater. During performances of Magic Flute, for example, he wrote to his wife, who was away at Baden taking the cure, um, you cannot believe how charming the music sounds when you hear it from a box close to the orchestra, much better than from the gallery. So he was probably sitting right up there. As a conductor, Mozart had extremely high standards and expected a lot from his musicians. Niemicek wrote, his hearing was so fine, he perceived differences in pitch so exactly and correctly that he noticed the smallest mistake or discord even in the largest orchestra and was able to point to the person or instrument at fault. Yikes. Mozart himself admitted to getting into a rage when his singers missed their cues or made mistakes, and his wife Constanza recalled an occasion when he became irritated with the orchestra during a performance of Abduction from the Seraglio. She said, I was with him at the opera Il Seraglio when they took the time of one of the movements too fast. He became quite impatient and called out to the orchestra without seeming to fear or to be aware of the presence of the audience. And even as fine an ensemble as the Prague Theater Orchestra could run into trouble, as happened with Don Giovanni, because Mozart got the overture to them so late, without time for a rehearsal, the musicians performed it at sight in, during the premiere. Its double bassist recalled later that Mozart cheered them for such good sight reading, saying, bravo, that was excellent, even if several notes fell under the music desk. 
Fortunately, the Prague musicians adored Mozart and were absolutely determined to play well for him, no matter how hard he made it for them to do so. One of the little known aspects of Mozart as a composer, though well known to his family and friends, was his tendency to procrastinate. This gives hope to us all. Um, while he was working on Marriage of Figaro and taking too long for the liking of the opera director, Count Rosenberg, Mozart's father, Leopold, wrote to his daughter, Wolfgang will always put things off and lose valuable time according to his charming habit. And now he must go to work seriously because he is being prodded by Count Rosenberg. And I bring this up because this was a particular difficulty with Mozart's overtures which he tended to put off until the last possible moment. All the arias, recitatives, and ensembles would have been written, rehearsals would be well underway, and the first performance looming, and he would still not have written the overture. And Nemechek left us a report on how the overture for Don Giovanni came into being. And he said, um, Mozart was writing the opera in October 1787. It was already finished rehearsed, was to be performed in two days, only the overture was still lacking. The anxiety of his friends, which increased by the hour, seemed to amuse him. The more nervous they became, the more lighthearted Mozart appeared. At last, on the evening before the day of the first performance, when he had amused himself enough, he went to his room around midnight, began writing, and in a few hours completed the astonishing masterpiece that connoisseurs rank below only the heavenly overture to the magic flute. The copyists were only just ready in time for the performance, and the orchestra, whose skill Mozart already knew, played it excellently prima vista at first sight. Of course, Mozart was not starting from scratch in this process as he usually had already made some sketches for the overture, and in the case of Don Giovanni, had something quite specific in mind that he intended to do, which I'll return to. This brings us to the function of the overture. It was meant to launch the opera, and that actually entailed a great deal. Traditionally, one of the key functions of the overture was to quiet down the crowd and signal to them that the show was about to begin. Opera audiences in the 18th century were sociable and chatty. People were standing around, visiting each other's boxes, commenting on each other's gowns, etc. So summoning them all to attention and getting them into their seats was the reason that so many overtures began with a series of chords hammered out fortissimo. Musically speaking, most early opera overtures were fairly generic and could be detached from one opera and played with another, or performed entirely separately as a symphony. The idea of relating the overture to the drama to follow, and even of integrating it with the rest of the work, began in the 1760s with the operas of Christoph Willibald Gluck. Mozart revered Gluck's music. Gluck was certainly the most successful composer of operas in the generation right before Mozart. So by the time Mozart was writing Marriage of Figaro and his other mature works, there was no question that the overture was intended not simply to quiet unruly crowds, but to establish an atmosphere and open a passageway that would draw listeners into the world of the opera. In the Overture to Magic Flute, which we'll hear first on this evening's program, its two parts reveal the main themes and even personalities that will mingle in the opera. The somber richness of the opening, the ascending triads, the presence of a trio of trombones, which in the 18th century symbolized the supernatural, and the stateliness of the introduction, all allude to the sacred realm of the priests in the drama and the spiritual prog progress of the protagonists, Tamino and Pamina. But with the arrival of the second section, with its swift repeated notes and merry atmosphere, we hear the comic world of Papageno. That Mozart makes this juxtaposition sound so natural is, of course, part of his own magic. 
In the overture to Don Giovanni, we also face a duality in that the opera appears to be a lighthearted and lecherous romp, but contains at its heart a dark tragedy. The most memorable and stunning moment in the opera occurs in the act two finale, when Don Giovanni, in the middle of feasting and reveling, is summoned to the door and confronts his doom in the stony figure of the man that he killed at the beginning of the work. We hear an overpowering, shrieking dissonance, which consists of syncopated, diminished seventh chords. Then the stentorous voice of the commendatore over a restless D minor accompaniment. This marvelous, powerful music, so fitting for this moment, also explains why Mozart was able to torture his friends by not writing down the overture until the last minute. He already knew that he was going to use this music to launch the opera. What is fascinating is how he chooses to do it. In the overture, instead of that super dissonant diminished seventh chord, he opens with plain D minor triads. That is dark enough. Moreover, the plangent sounds of the trombones, with their otherworldly associations, are also withheld until the dramatic moment itself. In the overture, we hear the other winds, including the bright trumpets and the timpani, but not the trombones. So he saves the strongest effects for the actual ending, but he gives us enough so that we have a strong sense of foreboding. It's a specific foreshadowing that we come to recognize only in retrospect. Then in the second, fast part of the overture, Mozart bursts out into a brilliant D major, a key that throughout the whole opera will be associated with the arrogance and the devil-may-care posture of Don Giovanni himself. So once again, as in Magic Flute, the overture serves as a psychological summary of the story about to unfold. So when we listen to these overtures without their operas, as people were already doing in Mozart's time, we are hearing wonderful orchestral pieces that stand perfectly well on their own. But we are also hearing Mozart, the master dramatist at work, already manipulating his audience and drawing it into the world of the theater. Each overture is populated by hidden characters whose spirits continue to live and thrive within the music. And is it up to us to follow Mozart's cues in our own imaginations? Thank you very much. So we've got a few minutes for questions if anyone has one that they would like to ask. Yes. Of, of Mozart? Uh, he, it was, he had a sister, um, and in fact, her, his sister was also a child prodigy as a musician, and um, like him, carefully trained, uh, uh, excellent musician. Uh, when they were children, they toured together as a pair of child prodigies. Her name was Maria Anna Mozart. The family called her Nonerol. Um, and it was just the two of them, and it was a very closely knit family. Mozart's father um, sort of ran his career until he was old enough to branch out on his own. And we don't really know the role that his mother played. There's very little known about her, but obviously she was an important part of the mix. So, yeah, it was a close family. Amadeus, yes indeed. Yes. That is imagined by Peter Schaffer, the playwright. We don't know whether it's true or not. I mean, what, what kinds of um, 
images and ideas enter the mind of a composer when he sits down to write a work. Surely he draws upon all of his own experience and his own psychological reality. So who are we to say whether or not his father played some role in his image of the commendatory? But, um, you know, he already knew the story and had it in front of him before the death of his father later that year. And so I, I'm not sure that making the connection between them is any more than simply a playwright's sort of ingenious license with the story. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, there is one more. Yeah. Oh, I, I think he was already romantic. Yeah, I think we, uh, yeah, the question was, since a lot of late Mozart sounds like early Beethoven and a lot of Beethoven sounds like late Mozart, did Mozart lay the groundwork for the Romantic era? And I would say that these so-called boundaries between classic and romantic are actually very permeable indeed. And that in fact, um, Mozart was already doing a lot of very romantic things if we define them that way. So his harmonies were becoming more advanced, and a lot of the kinds of sounds he was experimenting with in the orchestra were things that were going to be an important part of the next generation of composers. So yeah, the romantic was already flourishing <laughs> in Mozart's work. Yeah. Okay. Salieri, the rivalry between Mozart and Salieri. Yeah. Salieri was the court composer. He was uh, one of the most important musical figures in Vienna. And Mozart, as a newcomer in the 1780s, had to look up to Salieri. So rivalry is just not, not correct at all. There was certainly no ri rivalry on Salieri's part. He was an established figure of authority in the music world. Yeah. All right, let's end there because the orchestra has to get on the stage <laughs> and um, enjoy the concert. <laughs>